so when we look at that 70% of water, how much of that water is fresh water? Because that's the part that we need to know how much there is uh, because that's what we use. So about only about two and a half percent um, of the world is fresh water. But most of that is locked uh, in glaciers. So big sheets of ice that are up to kilometers thick. Uh, those there's lots of them in, an in the Antarctic. There's some in, like a major one in Greenland. Uh, and then on mountaintops as well. Those are really important for um, drinking water sources for different uh, cities and towns, especially sort of in the Rockies. And then there's lots of water locked deep, deep in the ground that we can't access. So groundwater sources, which we'll talk about a little bit more in depth in a moment, but uh, some of that water is so deep that we can't actually get to it. So out of that two and a half percent, I said most of that water is locked up deep underground or in glaciers. So out of that, only one percent of that water is actually available fresh water. So that is not a lot of water at all. Um, and it can be hard for us. So the ABCA is located uh, near the shores of Lake Huron and being so close to all the Great Lakes, it can be hard for us to remember that uh, fresh water is a limited resource um, because of where we live, there's so much fresh water. So let's talk a little bit about the Great Lakes. Now I love the Great Lakes. They are, uh, they're some of my favorite places on earth. Um, but did you know that, so when we talked about that 1% of freshwater, 21% of that is in the Great Lakes. So that means for us who live around the Great Lakes, live in a watershed um, whose water goes into a Great Lake, we have a huge responsibility to take care of the quality of the water uh, in the Great Lakes. So a quick review for those of us who need a few reminders about what the names of the Great Lakes are. We like to use the acronym HOMES, so H-O-M-E-S, to help you remember what the names of the Great Lakes are. So we, Exeter is located here-ish, uh, and we are located on the shores of Lake Huron. Lake Ontario, Toronto is located just about here. Lake Michigan is the only Great Lake that is fully in the United States. E is for Lake Erie, and S is for Lake Superior, the largest uh, freshwater lake by surface area in the world. And by surface area, Lake Huron is the third largest lake, which is pretty cool. And when we think about the Great Lakes, that 21% 20 of the world's freshwater supplies drinking water for 30 million people. That's a lot of people who rely on the Great Lakes for their drinking water sources. All right, so when we think about the Great Lakes and we think about watersheds, watersheds are the area of land that all drain into a specific water body. So this map is super great because it shows us not only the whole uh, the whole watershed for all of the Great Lakes altogether, but it's color coded them so that we can see specifically the areas that are draining into specific lakes. So for us here and the Asabo Bayfield Conservation Authority, um, our watersheds are located approximately here. And because we're green, we can see that we are part of the Lake Huron watershed. Now just south of us, so the Thames River watershed, it drains, it drains into Lake Sinclair, but is considered part of the Lake Erie watershed. So for those of us uh, who live, if you live like in Lucan, uh, you're sort of at that boundary point between our two watersheds. So it's important to know where your water is going um, and that will help you take better care of your water. So one of the really cool things about the Great Lakes, so 21% of the world's fresh water is in them, but also there's a lot of cities and towns uh, around uh, Lake Huron that actually rely on groundwater for their drinking water source. And because the Great Lakes have so much fresh water in them, there hasn't been a lot of study happen or around how much groundwater is available in the watersheds of the Great Lakes. But some say that it could maybe even be considered the sixth Great Lake because there's so much water underground uh, in the watershed of the Great Lakes. 
So how do we use water in our lives? Take a moment to think about even the just this morning, how have you used water? You've probably had, if you're an adult, you probably had some coffee in the morning. Um, you had some water to drink, perhaps. You used it in cooking. Maybe you had a shower this morning. Maybe your plants needed to be watering, watered. All of those things are how we use water. So one way that we don't always consider when we're thinking about water use in our daily lives is the use of water in industry. And if we take a look at water use in Canada, about 68% of water used, so treated water that's eventually put into um, a municipal system for people to use, but 68% of that is used by industry. 12% is used by agriculture, so that's everything from watering your livestock. Obviously, every living thing it needs water to survive. So, like you have some dairy cow, they need water to drink. So that's included in that 12%. And then this 20% is a pretty big uh, section of the pie, and that's our domestic water use. So how you use your water at home. About 10% of that goes to cleaning um, and or drinking and preparing meals. 25% goes to cleaning, and that includes your laundry, because laundry can take a lot of water. But 30% of it just goes to toilet flushing. That is a lot of water to just be whisked away down the drain. Uh, and then 35% is uh, taken up by bathe. All right, so in the uh, Sable Bayfield, Conservation Authority, uh, many of our municipalities in, in our area rely on water from wells. So, and a lot of our residents who live rurally or outside of the towns and villages in our watershed, they rely on personal groundwater uh, and personal wells to get their drinking water and water use for their homes. So a well is the most common way to obtain that groundwater, so that water that's deep in the ground for household use. A well is basically a hole in the ground uh, held open by a pipe or some sort of casting, uh, particularly if it's an older well, that extends to the aquifer, which is a natural underground water reservoir. And then a pump which we can see is sort of a old fashioned style pump here. Most pumps these days are electric. Um, those pumps will draw water from the aquifer uh, for the distribution system through the plumbing system. So that could be to your own house, or if you live in towns like Clinton or Seaforth, that could be for your whole town. Uh, the depth that the well is constructed uh, to is determined by the depth of the groundwater, the groundwater quality, so how clean, how good is the groundwater, and the geological conditions. So what is underneath the ground? Now, here in the ABCA watershed, our, our, um, our bedrock is mostly limestone, which means there's usually lots of good paths for water to move through the area. Uh, but then overlaying that limestone is glacial till for the most part, uh, which can, some of it will allow water to flow through really easily and some of it won't. So it, there's a big range of how water can move through the ground in our small watershed. All right, so let's take a look at a surface water system. So this is the Lake Huron primary water supply, and it supplies water for about 350,000 people. So that includes residents uh, in towns of Lucan and Grand Bend and Exeter, and also a good portion of London as well which is really interesting when we think about it when I said the Thames was part of the Lake Erie watershed. So water from Lake Huron is going to the town of London and then eventually ending up in Lake Erie instead of back in Lake Huron. That's just an interesting one. Um, so the water from the lake is cleaned and transported across the region. Um, and the plant currently has a capacity to treat 340 million liters of water a day, which is a lot. That's a lot of water. Um, but when we're looking at 350,000 people, plus all the industries in those towns and villages and cities, uh, that can make up a lot of water use. 
All right. So from a conservation authority's perspective, we want to protect our drinking water sources. So us as an authority, we don't do the work of treating the water or maintaining the distribution system. That usually falls to the municipalities. Um, but we want to protect our sources and a clean environment, a healthy environment will yield clean and healthy water, which makes it easier for the treatment plants to provide uh, clean, safe drinking water throughout the distribution system. So there's five main components of a drinking water system. And each of these layers provides a barrier and we use a multi-barrier approach in protecting our drinking water. So our job as an authority is up here protecting our source water. So we're sort of that first barrier in the line to make sure that when the water goes through the distribution and distribution system and ends up in your tap, it's clean and safe to drink. So why do we do this work? Um, so our work is driven by the Clean Water Act, which um, provides the legal framework for protecting our current and future sources of drinking water. So it's one of, it's a big responsibility to think about um, how might the population of this area grow in the future and how can we meet the needs of that population in the future. All right, so at the ADCA and at all conservation authorities, um, we not only manage our source water and do everything we can to maintain uh, a healthy environment to protect those sources, whether they're groundwater or surface water, we also manage water beyond that. So we do a lot of work around flooding. Um, and in fact, just yesterday, the ABCA issued a watershed condition statement uh, due to the rain that is forecasted to fall over the next day or so. Um, and what a condition statement means is that a flood isn't likely. So it's not likely that the river is going to overflow its banks, but the water in the river, there's going to be a lot more of it. It's probably going to be flowing right at bank full um, and it's going to be flowing really fast. So it's really important for us even if whether uh, we've issued a condition statement, a flood watch or a flood warning, it's very important for us to know that those are happening so that we can take care and caution around our water. So we also uh, issue drought warnings. Uh, these are more commonly issued in the summer months uh, and they can be issued at various levels. And we work with the municipalities on uh, what level you, we issue for your, your municipality. So this could be a level one where we ask people to reduce the volume of water that they use. It could be a level two where we're asking people to reduce their water use further. Um, and then a level three is a pretty extreme scenario where um, it may involve some mandatory water use. So it's not uh, voluntary any longer. And then finally, we also do some work around uh, water quality monitoring. So we do a lot of work uh, throughout the year collecting uh, water, water quality samples, especially after a big rainfall event. So you best believe our water quality staff is out there right now collecting samples. Um, and they also survey uh, macro invertebrates, so the bugs that live in the water, because depending on what, how, depends on the quality of the water, tells us what we're going to find in there and vice versa. So if we find a certain assemblage of species, so how much, how many different species are we finding? How big is the population? Uh, how are they distributed? All of those tell us about the quality of the water. Um, we also measure things like phosphate, nitrates, dissolved oxygen, and pH, which is a measure of the acidity of the water. Um, and then we also look at things like temperature, turbidity, and speed as well. And then all of these things are used every, so we collect all of these things on a regular basis, regular recurring basis. And then every five years, the Conservation Authority issues a watershed report card. 
Um, and then we use all of this data to give a grade to the water quality. For the ABCA watersheds, uh, our grades range from A to D. So some of them are doing great, some of them are not, um, but mostly C. So we do have some work to do on water quality in our area. So let's talk a little bit about how water gets polluted. So we talked about, we sort of glossed over what a watershed is, but it's that area of land where any precipitation that falls on there, whether it's rain or snow, is gonna eventually make its way to a specific water body. So if you live in Exeter, you live in the Sauble River watershed and any water that either falls on your property or snow that melts on your property is eventually gonna make its way into the Asable River, which then makes its way to Lake Huron. Now you might think, I don't live right by the river. How does that happen? And that's because the water will flow over the land or as the water goes into the ground, um, it will carry certain things with it. And then the way the ground is shaped, whether the water is flowing above the ground or below the ground, it does make its way eventually to the river. So uh, what we do on the land has a really big impact on our water quality and any pollution. So when we look at this picture right here, there's a few things that we can point out right away that are gonna impact water quality. So we've got this person right here throwing something on the ground. Physical litter is a source of pollution and something that we can easily visibly see as um, people when you're taking a walk along the river. Now, this person right here is pouring something directly down a storm sewer drain. Now, storm sewer drains, unlike the pipes in your house, they are not connected to a wastewater treatment facility. These drains are usually connected directly to the river. So basically, whatever you pour down a drain is like you just poured it directly in the river. So we recommend nothing but rainwater should ever go down um, a storm sewer grate on in the road. All right, so when we think about water pollution or even pollution in general, uh, we can sort of put it into two categories, visible pollution and invisible pollution. That visible pollution are things that we can see easily with the naked eye. We don't need to do any like fancy chemical analysis. Um, and they include things like plastic and garbage. Single use plastics are a big source of garbage in the Great Lakes, about 10 tons of plastic gets dumped into the Great Lakes every year. Uh, fishing gear, if you lose a bobber, or you leave some fishing line nearby. Um, and then we have sediment. Now you might not think that dirt is a source of pollution, but uh, Sediment can impact water quality. Um, and if the water is really turbid, which means there's lots of dirt picked up in the water, it can be really hard for different things that live in the water who may rely on their visual sight for hunting. Uh, it can really negatively impact their ability to survive. Um, and then things like oil and petroleum products from poorly maintained vehicles, uh, we can see those as well. Invisible pollutions uh, include our phosphates and our nitrates, which are most commonly found in fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Um, and then bacteria from animal waste. So making sure that we pick up after our dogs whenever we're outside is particularly important. Um, and then road salt as well. So this time of year um, is actually a big time when salt can have a big impact uh, on our water ways uh, simply because the especially today we've had a big snow melt but now we're getting a big rain and all of that rain is going to wash any of that leftover road salt into the river so what can you do personally to help protect our source water so the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you are um, properly disposing of hazardous waste. Um, so that could be paint cans, it could be oil cans, if you change your own oil, making sure that you're um, disposing of that oil 
properly taking it to the hazardous waste depot. I think especially for um, home gardeners, reducing or eliminating the use of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides and storing those well away from well streams and lakes is particularly important. So I think sometimes as home gardeners, we don't always have the knowledge that we need to apply as little as possible to have the impact that we're looking for. Sometimes we end up applying too much um, or we apply it at the wrong time. So if you, let's say, let's say you applied fertilizer to your garden yesterday, all of that would have been wasted today with the rain because it all would have been washed away. I am a huge proponent of uh, getting rid of your lawn entirely, replacing it with native plants or replacing it with a garden. Uh, lawns are incredibly wasteful for water and uh, they don't really do much for any of our native wildlife either. So native plants can provide a lot of habitat, a lot of food, uh, and they're beautiful and easy to maintain. Uh, maintaining your septic system. So for lots of folks in our area, uh, they don't, their homes are not connected directly to a municipal wastewater treatment facility. Uh, so they use septic tanks on their property to deal with their wastewater making sure that that is properly maintained and in good working condition can make sure that uh, nothing from your septic tank is leaking into groundwater. And often folks who have septic tanks are also on well water. So making sure that your tank is well taken care of is gonna be really beneficial uh, for you who are drink, uh, getting your own and treating your own drinking water on your property. Uh, making sure you inspect your home heating oil tanks regularly, select non-toxic chemicals and cleaners, reduce runoff and erosion near streams and rivers. So that could mean that you're gonna plant a strip of mixed vegetation near shorelines with trees and native plants and pick up after your pets. This is incredibly important. And uh, I know sometimes during the snowy months, it can be tempting to just to cover it up with some snow. But once all that snow melts, all of that poop goes in to the local waterway, uh, which can have a detrimental impact for the quality of the water for everything else that lives there and relies on that water source for drink. So it's important when we're selecting any of the, these things that we think about multiple perspectives. So we want to think about what's good for us what's good for uh, the land and our waterways. So the ABCA also does um, a lot of work around stewardship. So not only do we monitor water quality and quantity, we work with local land owners to complete stewardship projects. Uh, these projects increase our natural cover. So trees and shrubs and tall grasses and uh, lots of wonderful things like that. Um, and the use of best management practices on uh, your property to help minimize our impact. So we, the ABCA, provide landowners with technical advice. We have some cost sharing programs so you don't have to pay for the whole thing yourself. Um, and we connect, we have lots of connections and knowledge that can help you uh, navigate to that and learn a little bit more about uh, how you can do this on your own property. So some of our projects include cover crops, which we can see in the top photo right here. So cover crops are typically planted after um, after the harvest, uh, giving a couple months, maybe a couple weeks for these uh, plants to, one, they keep the soil in place, which is incredibly important and uh, prevents sediment pollution in our waterways. Um, and it can also aerate your soil, add nutrients. There's many benefits to cover crops. Fencing cattle and other livestock out of waterways and planting a vegetative buffer. So this is kind of like two things in one right here. So um, livestock, especially hooved livestock, can have, so sheep and cow, uh, they can have, they can cause a lot of erosion of the stream bank when they're um, entering and exiting the waterway. So by providing, by fencing your cows out of the waterway, the banks are going to be more stable. There's going to be less erosion um, and it keeps the water healthy. So even if you were to pump the water from the stream to your cows, they're going to have 
access to cleaner drinking water themselves, which is particularly important. Uh, best management practice is also manure containment. You can see that there is a nice roof over top of this big pile of manure. Um, and that's just so that when it rains, all of this manure doesn't just run off. Especially important if you want to be able to use that manure as a fertilizer. Uh, it does need to sit for a period of time before it can be added to fields. So making sure that it's protected from uh, a large amount of rain before that happens is important. We do a lot of tree plantings. Um, and then we also uh, help landowners uh, construct wetlands on marginal or poorly producing farm fields. So if you would like to learn more about source water and source water protection in the ABCA, uh, you can visit our YouTube page at Asable Bayfield and there's three videos there. Uh, one is on water treatment at the Godrich Drinking Water Treatment Plant. One is a virtual tour of the Seaforth Water Treatment Facility, which is an open well. Um, and then one is on how we protect drinking water sources near the Godrich intake. So as you probably know, there is a salt mine there as well. So how did the salt mine um, and all the other industries in Godrich work uh, and we protect our drinking water there as well. All right, friends, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about drinking water sources and uh, ways that you can protect them and take care of the land because we all live downstream from someone else. And thank you, Nina. That's, that was an excellent presentation. I was wondering if there are any questions. Thank you for watching our presentation, Judy, and uh, we'll cut this part out of our live presentation. And if you um, want to learn more, we're available at the, uh, the Conservation Authority. Uh, so thanks once again for joining us in the Lunch and Learn and uh, stay tuned for more. Bye for now.